Welcome, everyone, to the Sports Illustrated Media Podcast. I am your host, Jimmy Trainer. Thanks so much for listening. Got a good show this week for you. We've got Chris Mad Dog Russo from Sirius XM and now part of First Take. We've got Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk and then our Train of Thought segment with Sal Licata. Big show. We'll get to it in a sec. Just want to let you know if you missed any recent episodes. Last week, Jim Miller came on and broke down all of the NFL broadcasting madness with Aikman and Buck and Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet. Check that out. Two weeks ago, Molly Kieran from First Take was on the pod. Great interview with her. So if you missed any of those, go into the archives, check them out, and also subscribe to the SI Media Podcast. All right, let's get right into this week's show. Chris Russo, followed by Mike Florio, followed by Train of Thoughts, all right here on the SI Media Podcast. All right, joining me now, he's become a smash television hit on first take. It's not why he's here, though. He's here to promote a podcast, digging up the past for Sirius XM. He's been on many times. Christopher... Mad Dog Russo, a big television star. Thanks for making time for me now. Uh, how was my fifth child? Everything okay? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, yeah, appreciate that. And you've been a huge supporter. Yeah, I this came out of nowhere, nor did I ever think this would be on this level. Uh, but I'm, I'm having fun with it. That's at 62 years of age. What the hell? Having fun with it, Jimmy. Good to be good to be with you. How you doing? Okay. I'm good. I'm good. And we'll get into all your serious XM stuff. Everyone knows. Dog is on Sirius XM Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 Eastern. And now he's got a podcast on the Magic Bird 1979 title game, digging up the past. We'll get into all that. Here's one question I keep getting from people on Twitter about first take. They want to know whose idea was it to get you on there? Was that all Stephen A? Was it an ESPN executive? How did it all come down? Uh, Stephen A uh, texted me on January 22nd, um, asked me if he wanted to do Come on Wednesday to talk about the uh, Bird Magic, uh, not Bird Magic, the uh, Hall of Fame stuff with Bonds and Clemens. And I said, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll come in here. Yeah, we'll give you a segment. So I went down there on that January 24th when the Hall of Fame, I think, was either the day before. So it had been told that they weren't in the Hall of Fame. I did the segment. We did another segment because it was right after Green Bay lost to San Francisco. Right. So there was some juice with that game uh, with Rodgers and Brady almost beating the Rams. And I left. I went to came home and he called me up the next morning at eight. He, yeah. Called me up the next morning at eight fifteen. He said, listen, you know, we did a hell of a job. Are you interested in hearing anything, you know, uh, down the road? And I said, you know, absolutely. You know, sure. Why not? Blah, blah, blah. I got to work it out with the TV, with the baseball and everything else. The next day. The next day, they had a deal on the table, Friday. And so when I went to the Super Bowl, I went on the 8th. I got off the plane, and they wanted me to sign all the contractual stuff. Right. Background information, uh, how, you know, w, uh, W-2 forms. Yes. Proof, proof of vaccination status. Right. Um, and have that done so they can announce it at the Super Bowl. On a Wednesday morning. Right, right, right. Now, And I thought we were going to start on March 2nd because I was going away on the 23rd anyway and a prearranged going to Sarasota. Right. And a text and uh, they said, let's go on next Wednesday, the week after. So it happened pretty quickly. Do you think when you went in for that first Wednesday on the Hall of Fame, Bonds Clemens, do you think it was a trial run or do you think it went so well they thought, oh, wow, we got to do this? Probably a little bit of both. Yeah. You know, they needed the baseball guy on there that day. That was a huge topic. Bonds and Clemens, Steve took right. the other side. Uh, I didn't look at it as an audition, but I'm not stupid. I right. think, you know what, if I go out there and do a good job here, we are we are friends. If I go out there and do a good job here, you never know. Uh, but I don't know if the powers that be thought that this was an audition. I think they didn't necessarily think that, but I think they felt that we had a little chemistry, a little magic. Looking for some help there. Let's see if he's interested. And, you know, at first we thought that maybe I'd do half the shows at home, the appearances, and half in the studio. And I said, I can't. That doesn't work. Right. That's right. Still all 40 at South Street Seaport. I got a little more money for that. Let's do all 40 at South Street Seaport because I think it's important if you're starting something new that the both of you are looking at each other every day and I'm at his location. So I thought that was important, but I was pretty surprised that it went that quick. You know, remember you had to get some permission. 
Right. Uh, you know, especially with the big with the baseball people. High uh, heat baseball network. Yeah, yeah, that was the he, one he, I didn't you know, mention. It's, it's a second. It's another TV thing. Yeah. So you had to get a little permission, but you know they're they they got other issues right now that they weren't worried about little Chris Russo. Uh, they were <laughs> right in the middle of a lockout, right? Uh, but yeah, I was very. It happened pretty quickly, and I'm pretty yeah. surprised how successful it's been. So let me give you this a little backstory. I, I was never a big first take fan. Most you know when it started, and Skip Bayless was there. I I, I didn't get it, and then a couple of, a few years ago, maybe a year before the pandemic, I. I started to warm up to it and I found Stephen A to be a, a, a true character and entertainer and performer. And I did like a 180 on it and I said, I get what this guy is really good at what he does. He's really entertaining. Came on, he came on this podcast last summer. Good. And completely won me over. I thought he was. Oh, talking. really? Actually, he had, he's got that personality. Yes, he does. He did this podcast from his car. He, literally was going home from ESPN pulled over on the side of the road and did the, did the podcast. So he made a big effort. He made a big effort. Need, he doesn't need me. So that right. showed me something and I he was agree. great. And Molly, I had on a couple of weeks ago and she was great. I heard about that. All right. Um, so for you, what was your relationship like with Stephen A before this thing happened in the last, you know, couple of months? I don't know why. I don't know why, but I think there's a little bit of Stephen A looks up to me. You know, he probably was listening to me in 1989 with like Mike on, us. on FAN. That's 30 something years ago. He was probably right. just getting out of high school. Um, you know, uh, so I, you know, we all know that Mike put out on his Twitter page that, you know, Stephen A was maybe a candidate if Mike decided to do a partner after I left. So for whatever the reason, Stephen A has really looked up to me. I mean, I, it's, I know that's weird. I'm not yeah. that much older than he is. But he's always looked up to me. So because of that, I think that has made this well, made this successful, these first couple of little appearances. Because remember, Jimmy, it's his show. Right. And in order for that show to work, he has to let me get some carte blanche. Right. And a lot of guys wouldn't do that in his position. So he has to feel comfortable that if he's going to try this, the guy that he's letting do this, he's got to let him go. Well, you're and you're not afraid, and he's not afraid of getting be be beat up a little bit. That's very very significant. So give you're a hundred percent right. But they would have to be whether it's ESPN specifically producers Stephen A. They'd have to be incredibly dumb to bring in Chris Mad Dog Russo and then try to change him. I mean, they brought you in because of the way you are, I think, and they're smart enough to write you. They got to let you go. Have you gotten any like post show notes like "Don't do this," "Don't say no, that"? No, I haven't. Nope. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. I haven't gotten anything. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a producer gave me a great piece of advice and I didn't use it because I was going to talk about Manfred getting, you know, pounded last week with the baseball and that he was essentially Sonny Cologne at the toll booth. I was, I've used it on the radio, but yeah. I didn't use it on TV. He says, Chris, maybe not on TV. And I said, you know what? That makes sense. That's the only piece of advice anybody right. has ever said. Right. They let me, I killed Goodell yesterday on the whole thing with Calvin Ridley. Right, right. You know, they have been very, very good. I give them yeah. credit. They've let me right. go out there. And he specifically, and I'm not just saying this, he has allowed me and he doesn't mind getting beat up a little bit. He doesn't mind having somebody go after him. He deserves all the credit. Yep. You know, I give yep. him, oh, he really does. For let me on there, number one, and then let me be, quote unquote, a co host on the two shows that we've done. He deserves right. the credit for that. Absolutely. And Molly does a really good job. Very I, you good. Know, very, very, very good. good. Very good. You know, it's funny. Yeah. You, it's funny. You, I, I don't want to get into a whole thing about Mike and the Mad Dog and reminiscing and all that. You've done it a million times, but it, it, it you know, just hearing you say that. I wonder, listen, we all know everyone, people who follow me on Twitter, New Yorkers, if you're from New York, knows the bond that the Mike and the Mad Dog listeners had with that show. I wonder if it's like that for other shows around, the, like, you know, I don't know what goes on with EEI or whatever the big, you know, Jim Rome in LA, but like, I don't think it's just any sports talk radio show has a bond with the listeners, the way you and Mike, that bond still today. I mean, and I think that's where Stephen A plays. You know, you mentioned Stephen A looks up to you. Right. I think that's where it plays into it. I agree. I don't. Yeah. Do you know, is there another radio show? I don't know what it is. I mean, I think it was, you know, the perfect storm of you. I always think of, when I think of the bond we have with you and Mike in the show, I always think of 94, which in New York now, I think is impossible for people to relate to 
because the Knicks were good and the Rangers were good. And every single night were, were playoff games. You and Mike used to do shows after games, post game. Right. You know, on the road. Just, is Perfect it just storm. the Mike and the Mad Dog Perfect thing? Perfect storm. It is. Perfect but, storm. Do you think it's just the Mike and the Mad Dog thing? Or do you think there's other shows like that around the country that maybe we I'd say, you know, you got to be in a big city. Right. Um, I don't know if, you, you know, I think it's important to be. And, in, you know, you're looking at it from a local perspective. Right. Um, I'd have to think about that. Uh, is there a group? Of, is there a show host? You know, Felger and, and Maserati do a good job at the hub in Boston. I don't right. know what their connection is with their fan base. It's got to be pretty good. Um, uh, you know, I think Angelo cataldi has got a good group down in right. Philadelphia, that morning show. The thing with you and Mike, I mean, this goes back to like mid 90s and it still holds true today. I mean, there's just that. Yeah, I think it's father son. It's, I, I think it's perfect. And I think it's perfect storm, Jimmy. I mean, remember, you're talking about the first radio station that did sports all day. That's yeah. what you're talking about. The Giants winning Super Bowls. You're talking about the Yankees on their rise. You're talking about, as you said, 94, the Rangers winning their Stanley Cup. You're talking about the, um, you know, the Knicks with Riley. Yes. I mean, yeah, there's a lot going on. You know, the Mets and, were always up and down. There's a lot going on in the 90s and me and Mike with a soundtrack to it. And I'll tell you what I get, what I've gotten a lot of on Twitter these past few weeks when you've been on first take, when I posted the videos, I get a lot of, this is my childhood. This is the sound of my childhood. Really? A lot of that. That's why well, I've gotten up. a lot of, I've gotten a lot of, well, this is Mike and a mad dog on TV. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think there's something to that. Yeah. Uh, I think there's people like the by play, um, yeah. You know, and uh, I, I've been pretty surprised. I, I have to admit, I've been pretty surprised that so much people are so into it these first couple of days, or first couple of shows. I talked about this once with Stu Gotts, who is a big fan of yours from yeah, the Love Guitar yeah. show. He's a huge yeah. fan of yours. I had him on here and we talked about this. And so, you know, you got to do the sports talk. But what I think people like more than anything, more than anything is the busting balls. You yeah. and Stephen A have done a little, you haven't done a ton of it. There's been, I think you'll do more. You got to, you know, I got to feel them out. There's got to be that element of busting balls mixed in with the sports. And I think that's what brings the people in. I think there's some truth to that. And I've, I've been very surprised how many people out there like the idea that he's getting beat, that I won a couple of these debates. Right. right. I've been very surprised. And again, give him credit. He don't right. care who wins the debates. He's interested in doing right. good TV. Right. That's what he cares about. A lot of guys wouldn't be in that same spot. So they like to see me win. Right. So that's got a little of that busting ball mentality. The fact right. that he lost something. So I think that element could be added here down the road. So I listen, I, I, there's nothing much not to like. It's only been, right. now listen, let's not go crazy. We've done what well, we've done. We've done three, right? We've done three episodes or three, uh, three shows. Right. That's not a, you know, Rome wasn't built in three shows. Right. You give you a chance. Now let me ask you this. Cause it could go either way. Close your ears, Andy Fitzpatrick. Is Sirius XM happy about this because you're getting so much publicity? Or do they look at it like, uh oh, what if Chris, you know, pays more attention? I think, to I think Sirius XM is happy about it. Okay. Um, you know, they're getting some juice out of this. I'm never going to leave the radio because I love it anyway. Uh, who knows? Maybe I'll sign another extension, you know, to make them think that I won't leave. Right. Um, you know, this will be an adjunct more than it would be a replacement. So, right. and I, you know, me, Jimmy, I, I know, I understand the radio is a different audience, especially in 2022. You don't have as, I understand, you don't have as much power. I get that, but I love doing the radio. Right. I so know. As a result, I just don't see, I don't see me not doing that. So I think Sirius Down Deep probably knows that. Yeah. I, last yeah. thing. I'm, you know, the best thing, you know, yeah. I'm going to tell you this. I'll, I'll tell you this to be interesting. You know, you know what I, as I mentioned this to uh, Lebertor, you know, the best thing that I, that the last two days with this, I was shocked. You know, you know, direct message me and I would never know it. Eddie told me right. and I cannot get him on, which is amazing. Uh -huh. And it's not a big deal, but I was, wow, really was Herb Street. There you go. There you go. Loves it. Right. Listener. Follow me forever. I was shocked. You should have asked him to come on and talk well, about. I don't want to do that. I mean, I, know, I, know, I, know, I, know, I don't, don't want to, you know, uh, thanks for thanks for being a fan. Now I need right. John. I, I, that's not what I you want to do. I know. But, I, know. Uh, but I, I was I was moved by the fact that Herb Street took it 11 o'clock last night. Right. Out of his busy day and said, you know right. what? I got to send him something. And he didn't know how to reach me. He doesn't have my right. text. Right. And he done it. He did it through the Instagram. And Eddie, knowing that we've had trouble getting him on for whatever the reason, 
called me up at 10 o'clock and said, you're not going to believe who reached out. And I didn't know who you told me. Made me feel good. Go ahead. You know, can I give you one that I had recently that you'd be impressed by? Yes, I sure would. I'm not trying to do a like, can you top this and make it about me? But you actually play into this. You play into this. And I'll tell you how. At the end of the year of the last year, I wrote a thing for the magazine. It wasn't online. It's the magazine of like, uh, you know, best and worst, biggest stories in sports media for the year. And I did a little thing on the biggest retirement in sports media. And I said it was Marv. Yeah. The well, day before I Christmas, I get a text message on my phone, text message from a number that I don't have in my phone. Marv, thanking me for the kind words and enjoys my column. That would make you feel good. And here's what, and I texted it to my best friend who I've been best friends with since seventh grade. And I said, do you remember when we were in high school, we would go in my drive, my parents' driveway with the basketball hoop, put on Mike and the Mad Dog before the Knicks and Rangers playoff games, shoot hoops, play horse, listen to Mike and Chris and imitate Marv Albert. And then Marv Albert texted me. Yeah, that would make you feel good. Uh, And he's good with that. He's done that before and he reads everything. That's a great job. I, t- I, I, I thought you'd like that one. I like that one. I yeah. had Marv on too when he, before he retired. I, I love the spot. Yeah. I love yeah. the spot. Yeah. yeah. All right. Love it. Let's do uh serious XM here for a little bit. You know, and oh, well, the last thing on first taking it does tie in. I, I asked people on Twitter if they had questions. And, you know, another thing that's happened throughout this is so many people like sign Russo full time, make Russo the full time hearse, need Russo. Fi- it wouldn't work five days a week, I think. Once a week is perfect for this because you guys yeah. are just too combustible. Five days a yeah. week. Yeah, you, you wet everybody's appetite. Right. You wet exactly. everybody's appetite. Something to look right. forward to. Yeah, I, and right. I, I, it's way too soon to jump into that kind of role on a day in, day out basis. That's a lot of work going down there and doing oh, it. Yeah. I live in Connecticut, yeah. I'm getting down there, a lot of work. What's the status now with Sirius XM, your show, 3 to 6 Eastern? Are you in the studio at all now? You're home every day. Uh, we're going to start two days a week in the studio. I'm going to go in next week for a couple of days. First time I've been in that studio since March 11th of 2020. That's we're wild. Gonna Wenzel. We're going to do Wenzel right. with the NCAA tournament. Right. So next Thursday and Friday, the old Jacksonville coach, CBS, yeah. who's a good guy, knows all the teams. He's going to come up. And we're going to do three to seven, uh, taking out on a story, three to seven Thursday and Friday for the first two days of the tournament. And that is the first time that I've been in that studio for two years. You know, I don't want to I don't want to, you know, get you in trouble, but everyone gives Howard Stern so much crap about not being in studio. The doggy hasn't been in the studio either. What's going I on? I haven't. I have not been in the studio either. Um yeah, and Howard has not been anywhere near it. I think Howard even is going to go in. Yeah, we're going to go in. Now, I'm going to start two days a week, probably combine it with the first take day, you know, so the morning in the city, right, you're ready that city. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but I probably will start that. I would think uh, Eddie Erickson would tell you probably about April 1st. Remember, if I go in, they got to go in too. You know, here's the secret. You think that I don't want to go in. I don't care going in. Erickson and Colin Schmelling, the two guys who work on the show, the last thing they want to do is commute from Massapequa into the midtown Manhattan and do it. Right. They love doing the show at home. They both got kids and everything right. else. Well, you I know don't much- care. Get yeah. away from the wife. I'll, I'll get away from Jeannie. I'll come down and do the show. <laughs> and she gets and she gets me out of the house. The other two, uh-uh-uh. They want to make sure they stay at home. So they're more annoyed about it than I am. For crying out loud. As a Long Islander who used to travel into Manhattan, I know what Eddie's, th- Eddie's thinking. He's saving like $400 a month. On Absolutely. And, he can get, and he's quote unquote is I can get more work than when I'm home, which is a bunch of nonsense. That's a lie. Yeah, that's a lie. Eddie's, Eddie's placing wagers on the side. While he's oh, trying. he sure is. And yeah. Eddie comes up here. You know, he's been up here probably about once a week. Yeah. Um, you know, he, 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 just so I see him. You know, I have a little audience. It's a little better. So he's been out here, you know, maybe every 10 days he comes, I mean, eight days he comes up for the day. All right. Let's talk about your podcast and we'll, we'll do other stuff after that. I, I, isn't it? I mean, listen, we're in a little bit of a same boat where you're doing a national show. I write for a national audience. College basketball to me is so weird. Nobody could possibly care less. Of, they could not care less about it. Until this week, and then all of a sudden, everyone comes out of the woodwork. It's a very weird sport that way. It is niche, niche sport. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I did it, uh, you know, for, for me, when I do a podcast, I can't do a, a radio show as a podcast because I, they can hear me on the radio. Right. So for me, they got to, I got to do something different. So you're perfect. You can write, and it's not the same as doing a show. Uh, me, it's the same thing. So I have to do something a little different. And that's where this historical aspect has come in. So last year, 
with the NCAA, we did the first 40 years. We did from 39 to the Bird Magic game. Right. So this year, the plan was to do the 80s and, you know, come up with a podcast to cover the 80s in, in, in college hoops. So we did it in a five part series. Uh, the first one we start and the bird magic game sort of stands alone. We'll do that, which dropped a couple of days ago. Listen to me with the terms drop. Yeah. We did one. We're doing one with the, um, the, the rise of the big East because the biggest was big East was in the eighties. We're doing one on NBC losing the rights in 81 to CBS. That's a good one. Uh, and we're then we're doing the classic games, Valvano, right. the, Bur- the, um, the Indiana Syracuse game, obviously Jordan and Ewing, uh, you know, Larry Brown against Oklahoma when Kansas won. PJ against Michigan when the bad call when Michigan with Rice beat Seton Hall. So we're doing, and then of course the Lapis. Uh, we did Lapis and Pickney with the Villanova game against Georgetown. So we're going to do it in that series. There's like five parts to it, and the first one was a couple of days ago. Now listen, getting a spot sign for me is not easy. I didn't get Bird and Magic to do it. Right. You know, I got plenty of players and I got plenty of big people, but you know, Bird. Magic, Worthy, Jordan, and Ewing, as of right now, I have not gotten on. So, you know, you do what you got to sure do. You get Ewing, especially now that they're Well, well they, don't forget, they did go 0-18 in the regular season in the Big East. They're not in the away. mood to go break down his what happened as a freshman against North Carolina. So, yeah, right. part of it is right. the record. Right. Um, but I we got a chance to get Ewing. Um uh, we've done 23 interviews for this, but we've done everything. You know, we did PJ and Larry Brown and uh, Bayheim, and I did Trangisi and I did Billy Packer and Raftery and Danny Manning and Daryl Griffith. I mean, you did plenty of spots and, you know, you put it into a series. And the first one was the bird magic game alone, which is a 40 minute part one, only about that game. And it's, right. and it's it's I heard it the other day. It's good. They did it. Uh, Billy Zimmerman puts it all together. Does a hell of a job. It's called digging up the past, and you can find it on SiriusXM on the app on the website and all that stuff. So make sure you check it out. Um, Dog with his podcast. I now, but I it's I like that you do the podcast because you I think you don't really have a ton of respect for podcasts. Uh, you know, I said that to Howard that that one day when well, he Howard doesn't definitely like it. doesn't respect. He it. hates it. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, the point about the podcast is to me, the thing about it that you that you don't get is you don't get the uh, day. In, it's not a day in and day out, day out grind the radio every day, you know, is every day. You got to figure out a way to get through three or four or whatever it might be hours of the show podcast. Right. You can pick your spots. Right. So to me, it's a it's a little different. Uh, I know it's the way I know it's the wave now, you know, Joe Rogan, yourself, uh, you know, and I've put you in a Rogan thing with a million of them. But you know what I'm saying? All of these podcasts, the big ones have a tremendous shelf life. And so that is the way they get their message across. It's not so much listening to the radio anymore. It's other avenues. And so, you know, I have to make the adjustment, too. So that's why I'm doing these. Right. Well, even with your show. What I what I love about it more than anything is that if I am busy, I can start it at three thirty. I can start right. it at four o'clock. Right. You can pick it up when you, you want. Know, a lot In the of old times, days you couldn't do that. In the old that, days you couldn't do that. Right. So what I you know, a lot of times I have to pause your show and then I'll pick it up again at six thirty after you're done and I listen to the rest of it. So the the technology and the apps and all that are, are have been huge for radio, even though people may be going more away from radio. Well, I think the thing that I've learned most of all about doing a radio, Jimmy, in the last 10 years is they listen to sports talk and clips. They yes. don't sit there and listen to, you know, uh, some who do the diehards, right. but they don't listen. OK, Russo's on. Let's listen to the whole first hour. Right. They don't they don't they listen to clips, whether we put it out on it, their social media, right. whether they Instagram it, whether we have the video going, me doing a monologue. They listen to the clips of it. More so than they, you know, I would put a little bit on the app so you can hear an interview or something like that. They don't listen to the three o'clock he's on. He's off at six. In the old days with Mike and me, people listened to, they may have started at one to hear what we were going to start to talk about, picked it up again at 3.30. And I know drive home at 5.30, they heard the last half hour, last hour. Right. They don't do that anymore. It's right. a different way they consume. Well, and it. also the other issue is when it was Mike and the Mad Dog 1994, that was it. 
That's what you're saying. Yeah, it's yeah. five billion po- people go on Instagram live and do a show. People go on TikTok and do a show. You got podcasts. It's you know, you and you know, back then, if you lived in New York, you can only listen to Mike the Mad Dog. Now I can listen to any radio show in the country. So that's true. I mean, it's tough. so I it, the selection is so great that they right. almost have to do it right. in clips instead of doing it uh, all the way around. That's why they Mike and the Mad Dog dang, you know, was first of its kind all day. All right, you know, back in let's have some fun with some random topics here before I let you go. First of all, let me just say one thing about the radio show. I love the guillotine. Yeah, the guillotine's funny. The, with the I love that. we can, he got, That's because <laughs> Colin doesn't want to fool around with the recapture when we play it over at night. He wants to be off at six and have his dinner with his two kids. So he guillotines the calls <laughs> so I don't get he doesn't get caught in a break situation where he's got to everything. That's what that's it. all about. Go ahead. Why can't, as you called him, Leonard DiCaprio being a sweet at a Rams game. Is he there in the middle of October when they're playing, uh, you know, some lousy team? No. That's the reason. So you have to be at all the games to then be. You got to show me that you're more of a fan than a guy who just shows up for a Super Bowl for crying out loud. So from that standpoint or a championship game, that's going there to be seen. And I want to protect a sports fan and say, you know what? I want a legitimate guy who you know, okay. doesn't have to live and breathe his team, but knows who his offensive linemen are. And I, he I, doesn't know that. That's no, I, I completely love that rant. But here's where you're off on that. The average Rams, there are no Rams fan. Nobody cares about that team anyway. But the average football fan can't be in a suite. They don't have the money to afford a suite. The average fan. The suites are for the Leonardo DiCaprio's. I understand that. But I mean, do you think Leonardo DiCaprio is a huge Rams fan? No. You think he's sitting there watching Ram football? Mm, if he, he did, if he didn't sit in the suite and had to sit at the thirty yard line and deal with all the traffic and he didn't have to take a helicopter to the game, do you think that he'd freaking be at the ball game? No, and that's what bothers me. I have more respect for him though than the celebrities who root for twenty different teams in the same. Oh, no, I totally agree with you. Well, we don't even know if he roots for the Rams. So we uh, as it been ascertained right. that our buddy Lenny is a huge Ram fan. Lenny, uh, you tell me. I, 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 I didn't realize that all of a sudden he goes back to Gabriel and Bob Waterfield. I mean, that's the issue that I have with him. And I think you're right. I think the point you're trying to make is that all Ram fans are probably like that. But I just happen to pick on him. So you might be right about that. Well, my thing is, you, you know, your issue with him being in a suite. That's who the suites are for. The suites. Are oh, for I see. You're, you're more wrapped up on the suite than well, you're wrapped part, up on being in the game. OK, that's that an, what I had. I think the suite. I, you would have more. I think you'd have more respect for Leonard, if he was in like the third row at the 50, if I saw him sitting in the stands at that game with somebody, I would say, you know what? The guy might be a little, I mean, did he go to the Ram game because he had a sweep or did he go to the Ram game because he's a Ram fan? Uh, Which one is it? Every I mean, week? anybody can you any, but my wife would want to go to a football game if she was going to have a suite and a ladies room right there and food at her beckons call and she can leave when she wants to leave. That's a big difference than saying, honey, we got to drive. We got to park the car and we're sitting in the other uh, and it's cold out and we're sitting, you know, 20 yards behind a goalpost. Right. I mean, I, I don't want to go to that. Well, if it's the suite at the 50 yard line and you can talk to other famous people, you know what? I'll deal with it. Yeah, That's why I think it's a bit I, of a I think the Rams just invite every a million celebrities every week to go in those suites. And then that's what ends up happening. I think and you're poor, probably right. And he showed up. So I picked on him there. Yeah. And I, and poor Al during the Super Bowl when he had to read off the names of celebrities, he sounded like he wanted to vomit. Yeah. I see. He would be bothered by that. Al. Yeah. Where is he going to go? By the way, I guess he's waiting for Joe Buck. He's got to wait for Joe Buck. If Joe Buck stays at Fox, Al will probably go to ESPN for a year. If Joe goes to ESPN, then Al will probably go to Amazon. The wild card in this, I think, which hasn't been talked about, maybe it's not. A, if Joe goes to ESPN, wouldn't you, if you were Fox, try to get Al for three years? Here's the thing. He got the baseball, too. We can do the baseball. Fox has two of the next three Super Bowls. I know that. Are they going to go with Kevin Burkhardt, who I like and is great, and Greg Olson for that? I don't know. I don't That's know. a very good point. You, nobody's brought that up. Fox could say, the heck with it. Why pay Joe $100 million? Let Joe leave, and we'll bring Al in for three years. He can do the Sunday night, Sunday afternoon games, and we can give him the two Super Bowls, right. and we can have him do the baseball. If right. they want to go that direction, they can have Al do the baseball with Smokes. And you don't under- do that. And what I keep telling people, don't underestimate this. Fox has two of the next three Super Bowls. Goodell's going to want a top crew in there. Yeah, Remember, they do. Goodell's the one who wouldn't let Mike Tirico do Thursday night football when NBC got Thursday night. He said, no, it has to be Al. So, Good point. 
Goodell's not going to let anyone do the next two of the next three Super Bowls for Fox. They got to, you know. Yeah, that's a very good point. I hadn't thought about how now I would not get the, you know, it's a Sunday afternoon game. It's not a national game. I mean, he's going to get an occasional one o'clock Carolina and Philadelphia game that nobody will watch. Yeah. So he's going right. to have to deal with that. But he does get, you know, the ch- NFC championship and he does get well, two Super Bowls. And if he wants, he might have a chance to do some baseball, which he hasn't done in 25 years. And here's the thing. You have four time slots, Sunday, 425, Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday night. Out of those four slots, the one with the most viewers is Sunday at 425. Yeah, I know that. So it's People not don't realize doubt. that. Yeah. People don't realize that. That window is the, right. is the biggest window. People think it isn't. They think it's probably Sunday night or Monday night. But you're 100% right. That 425 window on Fox with the NFC games specifically right. is a huge window. Right. So that would be, I think, very appealing to Al. Uh, let me, I know the answer to this because I listen to you every day, but tell my listeners around the country, how has the gambling stuff affected your show? If at all, or do you see, you have to do more of it? I mean, I talk about it. The cat's out of the bag. Yeah. I I talk about it more. The overs, the unders, the lines, the, this, the, at. you know, 10 years ago, I never would have mentioned that I would have taken Carolina with the 11 and a half points against Duke on Saturday afternoon, which I would have done. You made sure to make uh, that I point on first I never would have done take. that. Say again? You made sure to make that point on first Yeah, take. I know that. I did say that. Uh, no, never would I have mentioned that, even with Mike, a college basketball line. And right. no way we would, ever would, have, would have talked about it. Uh, so from that standpoint, it's omnipresent, and it's out there constantly. So you do make allusions to it. But Mike and I were doing the picks with spreads back right. in 1993. So this right. is not something that all of a sudden – we have now, you know, I get Lombardi on here or I get uh, whoever that might be. And we pick games with the, we've been doing this forever. So the big football picture with the spreads is something that has always been done. But the side scenarios, money lines, overs, other sports, you know, baseball series prices. You know, would you take the Dodgers plus 800 again? That is element has never been part of it. So and, all, and, 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 and the 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 just the domination of the fan duel and the DraftKings. Yeah, it's domination. Yeah. It's domin- And, you know, most fans now, I mean, they, you know, I had King on the other day. He said that uh, with the New York app, one out of six adults have the gambling app on their phone. One out yeah. of six. That's yeah. a yeah, yeah. that was not the case 40, 50 years ago. I, right. I pay attention to it, but I try not to. Uh, I still try to make sports the thing. I don't let it dominate the show. Do you not have any of the apps on your phone? I don't have the gambling apps, no. You do it the I old use, school I, way. I have a guy that I use. You do the old school way. I do it the old school way. So it's, that's, way. that's what Goodell's worried about with Calvin Ridley, the old school way. First off, those guys don't take huge bets. It's, it's, you're not gonna, you're, you're, uh, Ridley, he's making a fortune. He did not bet a half a million dollars on some parlay. Right. Plus, he did it legally. That's the dumbest thing. I, you know, the NFL that has wrapped their arms around the NFL uh, gambling things in all shape, way, and form, that has an owner who got accused of tanking games for $100,000, and they're worried about freaking Calvin right. Ridley? Oh, that has me bothered to no end. Me too. I, I wrote a whole column about it two days ago, and I said, I understand it's the rule. He should be punished. A year is absurd. absurd. Four games. All right. I'll buy it. You want to set an example? Not a year. Jeez. It's absurd. He's not fixing games. No, that, he's not. He picked the Atlanta to win, not lose for Clan right. Out Loud. He's not shaving points. This is not CCNY in 1951. Oh, my God. I went nuts. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Um, Did you like you- my reference to Jack Molinas yesterday? Well, at one point you mentioned Unitas, and I thought Stephen A. was going to walk off the set. Molinas was a huge, he was a huge gambling guy in the uh, in the sixties with Roger Brown and Connie Hawkins, and that is why Connie Hawkins got blackballed from the NBA because of Jack Molinas. Now, how many people know that? I'll give you buddy? the I'll give you the reference. I like more than that. It was on your radio show. It wasn't on first take, but I believe two days ago you referenced Big Pussy from The Sopranos. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I did. About, that was funny. No, no one's getting thrown off the boat over a, over a gambling loss. <laughs> I did say that. Funny, that was, funny, Jimmy. I gave you my fifth child. You know more about me than I do. Okay. You got that right. All right. I asked Twitter if they had some questions for you because you. I know you're not on. You know, Eddie does your account. I said, give me any non-Mike Francesa related questions because I don't want to go down the Mike and the Mad Dog path. We've, it's, it's all been done. Um, I don't know. Some of these questions are 
are just crazy. But there was one here that I wanted to do that was good for you here, and I should have had it ready to go, and I didn't. Um, go ahead. Oh, I got time. Who has been, outside of Howard, who's been the best person to interview you? Well, that's a good one. That is a good one. Dan, Dan Patrick's very, very good. Mm-hmm. Um, Howard uh, is tremendous. Interview me. Nick Bumgard, Nick Bumgardner uh, of the New Yorker was very good when he did that huge story on Mike and Mike back in 19, 2004. Um, the guy from the Wall Street Journal about my tennis, I think his name was Jason Day. Jason Gay. Yeah, Jason Gay, who was yep. excellent. Yep. Um, when I did that Wall Street Journal thing. Uh, Those are good. You, Those are you good. of course. You, of course. That's not. You don't have you. to do that. You don't have to. But, do but that. Howard, Howard is great. Right. Howard yeah. is the best. Yeah. Uh, the, when I, you're, Howard can make anybody sound interesting. And he keeps right. Sean forever. He knows how to. Look what he did with Brady a couple of years ago. He was superb. The next Howard's time the you go on there, you need to start dropping some F bombs and shock them. You know, I tell you, and I told him. Last time I was on was April 6th of last year. I said, why are you waiting over a year? How about within the next year? And he said he would. April 6th is a month, a month away for crying out loud. And I haven't heard from him. So there you and go. And Sour, Sour Shoes doesn't go on anymore. He's missing. He's missing. We, nobody, we, I got somebody else asking that question. Where the hell is he? I don't know. He's missing. I know. I, we haven't found him in a long time. Yeah. Here's a good question for you. If you could only listen to one play-by-play person for the rest of your life. Enberg. Well, I think he's got to be alive. Live. <laughs> Play by play. Uh, how about Bob Costas with baseball? You want all the sports? Mm, all right. Oh, Bob's good with the baseball. Mm. You um, don't like that one? Well, who would you take? Um, a lot of the young people don't like Joe Buck. Did you know, you know that? Uh, it, believe me, it's a whole big thing. It's ridiculous. Why don't they like Buck? Rid- Buck's good. Why don't they like Buck? Because people are stupid. You know that. People are dumb. He's great. He's great. I got a 19 year old kid who, who I, who I be, who we are friends with down in John. He calls all the time. Yep. He hates Buck. I, I said, John, I, what are you nuts? He's great. I think Buck and Aikman became the best team by far, but I will say this. I, and I love Joe and I, Al is still as good as ever. Al's great. Yeah. Al's good. Al's good. No question about it. Yeah. Al, Al is excellent. Uh, maybe we see Al do the baseball again. Al's very good with the football. Uh, him and Aikman be an interesting team. What they decide to do with Buck, um, there there are. I'm trying to think. You know, Ian is very good. Ian is excellent. You know, that's a guy. Who, Ian is very yeah. diversified. He can do any sport. Ian is very very good. He's also hysterically funny. Oh, he's funny, so, and he and he get and he's got the terminology that the young fan likes, which is right, important. Right. Um, some I got a tweet here from someone that said that you were offered ten to one on WIP and you turned it down. Is that yeah. true? And when did, when did that happen? Uh, that happened in uh, the winter of 89. No. So, uh, yeah. yeah. No, not the winter, okay. of, uh, the, the winter of 88. The winter of 88. Right before I started with Imus. Gotcha. And, uh, and, and uh, um, I forget his, the, Jay, uh, Jay, the boss's son. Who's, who's the owner of the, oh, Jay Snyder. Right. The offer of the 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 owner of the Flyers at the time, and I went down there for uh, about a month to do shows. I was doing shows in Philly, and I was doing shows in New York. I and I give him credit; he brought me into the office. He said, "Right now, we'll give you ten to one." Uh, you know, uh, he was afraid I go to FAN. But at that right. period, I had just gotten my legs under me with Imus, and I knew there was a chance. Who knows? And I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into Philly. But yes, that is accurate. Uh, and I, 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 I shouldn't even say that because maybe somebody at IAP won't like it, but I came very close. Well, if they came to me a month earlier, I'd have taken it. It was 1989. They'll get over it by now. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. the uh, it would have been January of 89. All it right. Been- I'm going to let you go after one more. But let me just say it one more time. Digging up the past dogs podcast on college football, uh, college football, the history of the NCAA tournament, college basketball. Right. Um, Sirius XM is where you can find that. Everyone who listens to you knows you're a Bruce diehard. Right. After Bruce, if I say to you right now, besides Bruce, you could go to any concert tonight. Who are you picking? Well, I mean, they're not going to play anymore. Right. How about if I said, you know, from 20, 30 years ago, I would go right. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. But what about someone today, like uh, today, someone who's. You know, I'm not as wrapped up on the new music as I should be. 
Right. And I had some chances to see Dylan here in the last few days, in the last couple months. And I love Dylan, but I don't want to hear those. So I want to hear the old right. songs. And he's right. not going to play "It Ain't Me, Babe." Right. Or right. you know, yeah, I'm right. not going to get that. So I, 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 I wouldn't do that one. If I could see a band today, who would I see? Wow, that's a good question. Well, how about I give you something? But while you think about yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you should give me some thoughts, and I should. I'll tell you if I want to see him. I right. I went Sunday. Five days ago, Nassau Coliseum, Elton John. Yeah, I've seen him a couple of times before. It was his last tour, too, right? That's right. Well, here's what here's what here's what I was impressed by. He did a show there Saturday night. So he did back to back Saturday, Sunday. No load At the management. Nassau Coliseum, huh? Yeah, no load management. He did two shows in Madison Square last week. I think he then did shows at either Barclays or the new UBS, USB, whatever it is. And then he did Coliseum. Saturday, Sunday, back to back, two and a half hours, 75 years old. That's a hell of a job. I was impressed. Uh, I would, you know what, right now, I've seen him before. I'll go see the Stones again. I want to see Go Jagger run around a little bit. Right. So maybe uh, and they're still touring, right? They're in the United States. Oh, yeah. They tour all the time, it seems like. Yeah. I mean, I I, I would say that sounds like Springsteen's going to go. And I've seen Betty Joel a million times. Let's not forget him either. Yeah. Yeah. $40 to park at the Nassau Coliseum is a little much. Was it? And so was it sold out at the Coliseum for Elton John? Uh, So here's what happened. He was there Saturday, Sunday. I wanted tickets, obviously, for Saturday. The Saturday prices were through the roof on StubHub. Sunday, the prices were like almost half the amount. People don't want to go to concerts on Sunday nights, I guess, because they got to go to work the next day. There were scattered empty seats, but it was for the most part sold out. But is he playing? Uh, did he have a warm up band or was by himself? No, by himself. And, and, here's, good sh- and here's another thing that shocked me. The ticket, you know, it says eight o'clock start time. He was on stage at 7.59. No fooling That's around. That's very good. I hate okay. when they get on at nine. Jackson Brown. I've seen him a million times. That's right. He just was out last summer with... Um, James Taylor. Yeah. Um, I didn't go and I probably should have. Uh, Jackson only played 10 songs. If I knew he was going to play 2022, I'd go. Right. But that is one, too. And I'm a huge Jackson Brown fan. I'll yeah. tell you what I hate and what needs to stop is the, the nonsense of the encore. Just stay on the stage and do the show. Why do you have to go away? We got to clap. Then you come back. It, don't waste my time with that. That's a very fair point. Very <laughs> fair. That You can make an argument. They're wasting 15 minutes. Right. All That's right. a well, very fair I'll end it there on a fair point. Digging up the past, Sirius XM, Dogs Podcast, first take, high heat. Now, what's the status of high heat? Well, we don't know yet because of the fact that, uh, you know, we don't know when it's baseball. It sounds like they might be relatively close. Yeah. Uh, you know, high heat, uh, MO, ESPN is going to give me a studio on Wednesdays on their South Street Seaport. So I don't have to worry about running somewhere to do high heat at one o'clock. I don't know if that, I told you that. That's big that time. Was good, that was yeah. a good one. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I would think well, eventually we'll get back on there on a day to base on a yeah. daily basis. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think we'll be the next day after they settle, maybe three or four days later. But I would think as soon as there's baseball and some, some spring training, you'd be right. doing high heat. And that's where it's going to be hard for me because right. one day a Wednesday. week we're going to have three shows to do, which right. would be hard. Right. But listen, it's better than not doing anything. Yeah, at 62 years of age, they still want to hear from me. Keep that in mind. How old are you, Jimmy? About 50, 52? Oh, my God. I'm, I'm in my 40s. What? 50s? Well, I think you're 12 years younger. What do you well, What? What do you mean 50s. you're in your 40s? Are you 41 or 49? Well, well neither of those. I'm in between that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me ask you this. Isn't it great to see the city back? Yeah, like, I know. I've been into it. Yes. I, I know. When I went that. to that Elton John show, I maybe there were maybe... 15 people tops. I saw wear a mask. It was it was bizarre. You know, no, I, I feel like it's weird getting back into it. I'm into it, but it's a little weird. getting. Back I into agree. It. There's yeah. the masks are not a big deal. I haven't taken a train yet. I'll take the train next week. We'll see. How yeah, I, I wore a train on the mask when I went into the city last week. That's the only time I've worn the mask in the past two weeks, three weeks. And I'll go to the Big East. I'll go to the Big East semis tomorrow if Connecticut wins tonight. Right. And I will see if, I, first time I've been in the garden. I'll be yeah. into that. Yeah. I'll be back into that. Dog, I appreciate the time. I know you're busy. I love you there, Jimmy boy. All right. Keep it Sirius up. XM every day, three to six as well. That, that's really the meat and potatoes. That's where I get. I over. still love it. I still love it. Yeah. Still love it. Yeah. That's where it all began. On the yes. radio. Yep. All right. Thanks, dog. On the radio. There you go. Take care, dog. All right. Okay. All right. Joining me now. Perfect. Perfect guest for this week's podcast, given the madness of the NFL and the author of a new book called Playmakers, How the NFL Really Works and Doesn't. Pro Football Talks, Mike Florio. Mike, how are you? 
Jimmy, I'm doing great, pal. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. We got to talk about playmakers and uh, get a little rundown on it. But let's let's start with uh, what a week so far. I want to ask you this before we get into Rogers Wilson. You know, in my world, the broadcasting madness has been carrying me with Aikman going to Monday Night Football. Buck is in limbo. We don't know what's happening without Michaels Herb Street to Amazon. Does that on on your on Pro Football Talk, which has been around forever? Does that stuff do well for you? Do you see uh, big numbers for content on the broadcasters? Yeah, absolutely. And my guiding light has always been, if it's interesting to me, I assume it's interesting to the audience. And that's the kind of stuff that's interesting because anybody that watches football, these are the voices that we associate with games, especially with big games. So there's always big interest in the various moving parts as these folks land. Now, when you get farther down the roster of the CBS and Fox announcers, people care less. But for who's going to be in the booth for the games that most people tune in for, a lot of people interested in that stuff. Yeah. uh, Thank God, because that's why I make a living. (laughs) Um, You know, and one of the things I think that gets lost, I I mentioned this, I think, last week when I had Jim Miller on, but I think you can speak to this almost as well as anyone. What people have to understand is, so there's all this jockeying for the announcers and ESPN wants to improve their Monday night booth. And, you know, Fox now could have a void for a play-by-play guy and an analyst, and they have two of the next three Super Bowls. And what I, what I want fans who, who are listening to understand this, the NFL and Roger Goodell are a big factor in all this. Like, don't ever forget when Thursday night went to NBC and the NFL told NBC no on using Tarico. They wanted Al. Um, they, the NFL and Goodell are very conscious of this and they want their, they want the best people on these primetime marquee games. Um, do you know, you know, do you hear about that in your contacts with, you know, what you hear about the league office and and things like that? Well, absolutely. They want the games to be presented in a certain way. So they want the best of the best on the big games. It's not that people are tuning in to see Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth. It's that their presence lets everyone know this is a big deal. Right. Aikman and Buck, this is a big deal. When I was growing up in the 70s, it was Pat Summerall and not John Madden. It was Pat Summerall and Tom Brookshire right. in the 70s. Right. That's right. when you knew it was a big deal. And I think that's what they want. Yep. This situation, though, is fascinating to me, Jimmy, because... What it's doing is, with all this money, it's creating real leverage for coaches who otherwise don't have leverage because they never become free agents. They don't want to risk losing their jobs. They always do new deals for as aggressive as they are. They're very conservative when it comes to doing their contracts and staying put. So Sean McVay has this magnet from Amazon this year that surely forced Stan Kroenke to dramatically increase his pay. Without this urgency to bump up the broadcasting booth and have high quality presentations, Kroenke doesn't get backed into that corner. So at some point, I think the owner is going to say, hey, well, let's not go crazy here. They want great presentation, but they don't want to be priced out of the market for their coaches. I find it amazing that it wasn't winning a Super Bowl. It was having Amazon out there that got Sean McVay big money. Well, what else is that McVay going to do? He can't right. leave. He's right. under contract for three more years. Right. And, you know, someone could call the Rams and say, we'd like to pay him $25 million a year and we'd like to trade for him. And all they have to do is hang up the phone. So I'm surprised more coaches don't become free agents, don't say, I'm going to go ahead and finish my contract and then go wherever I want. I think I addressed that in one of the essays in Playmakers because there could be some guys who would be heavily in demand, but you're taking the risk that you become a free agent and nobody calls. And so then you they think- fill your job and then you're out of a job. Do you think Mc, McVay came close to leaving the Rams and going to Amazon? Well, McVay had a meeting set with Amazon. I think that's been reported. I think Andrew Marchand had that. It's hard to keep track of who has what with these things. but It's usually always Andrew Marchand. Yeah, but if they're ready to pay him five years, $100 million, I think that he at least, if his agent's doing his job, right. they know that that's what's out there. And they shop it back to Stan Kroenke and he has a decision to make. And look, shed no tears for Stan Kroenke. I saw his yacht. It was in the hmm. marina where we were staying in advance of the Super Bowl. And I think those yachts cost like a million a week minimum just to maintain with crew and everything else. So he's got the money. And it's only fair that coaches get paid more. Their salaries have not gone up on the same trajectory as players. Even though there's no salary cap, I think there's some collusion that goes on hmm. to hold down the salaries. And so uh, it's good that there's now a path 
for some of these coaches to walk away if they want to. And in turn, if they don't walk away, they get more money from their current employer. But I will say, I think it's a very limited path in terms of, you know, these big jobs don't all open up often. I mean, this is what's going on now. The reason why it's so unbelievable is because, you you know, number one slots, you know, once the Joe Buck thing happens and then, you know, Al settles in and then Amazon makes a high, like this is going to be it for number one spots for a while. Cause I don't think, you know, Troy and Joe won't be going anywhere for a bunch of years. Romo just, and Nance just resigned. Now NBC obviously has Tariko to, so I, you know, I don't know two, three years from now, if this goes on again, this is a very unique time. I agree with you completely. And you're right. It's not going to be a common problem. There's not going to be a spot for the flavor of the month every January or February to jump from a team as head coach to a broadcast booth. And I think they are going to settle in with the kind of commitments they're making. How can they not settle in? Look at the buyout that you would have. If Amazon would have hired Sean McVay for five years and a hundred million, if they get bored with him after two years, well, they're going to owe him $60 million to not work. That has to factor into what they would pay to go get a replacement. And I think it would take a white whale, a Peyton Manning, a Tom Brady, somebody who would say, I want to do this to get one of the networks to buy out the current guy or reassign the current guy like CBS did with Phil Simms when Tony Romo fell into their laps, right. something like that. It would be a big name deciding to go pursue it. They're not going to be pursuing talent the way they are now. Um, let's shift to what took place this week. I, I saw a tweet. I think from you earlier. So we're going to butt heads here a little. I wasn't surprised Russell Wilson got traded and you're saying people like me are dopes. And how can you be surprised? <laughs> not you, not you, no, <laughs> no, me, no, no, me, no, me. I, I was not surprised. I just, I looked at it like it seemed like he wanted out. Rogers went to, I, I thought the timing was, I mean, the fact that, I, well, let me ask you this. My assumption is that Denver had this in place for a while or did it all come together yesterday after Rogers uh, on Tuesday after Rogers and McAfee did their deal where they announced his resigning. How did Both. give me the timeline? Both. I think what happened, and this is it's stronger than think. What happened was Denver was working both deals. Right. They had something in place, depending upon what Rogers ultimately decided to do. Now, Denver will try to get people to believe that Russell Wilson was plan A. The circumstances don't suggest that. Right. I think what happened was they had deal lined up with the Seahawks in the event that that's the direction they go. Deal lined up through David Dunn, Aaron Rodgers' agent, for what it would take to get Rodgers from the Packers if Rodgers had chosen the Broncos. And the Packers were able to truthfully say they had no trade talks for Aaron Rodgers because it was all lined up by the third party, Dave Dunn, mm -hmm. as to who's on board, where does he want to go, what are they going to pay him, and what are they going to give the Packers. So once Rodgers says, I'm staying in Green Bay, Denver pivots to getting the Russell Wilson deal done. And right. if Wilson really was plan A, then they shouldn't have done the deal an hour and a half after it's clear right. that Rodgers is staying in Green Bay. Right. So I think Rodgers was plan A, but they were ready. And maybe it was plan 1A and 1B mm -hmm. or A1 and A2 or something like that. Like maybe they were fine with yeah. either guy, but they had just a little bit of a preference for Aaron Rodgers. But uh, yeah, they're thrilled to get Russell Wilson. And uh, Wilson has to be thrilled to go to a place where they view him as a franchise guy and they'll use him as a franchise guy, not have a philosophy premised on playing defense and running the football. Right. Um, so then the big kerfuffle, I guess, on Tuesday was McAfee announces that Rodgers is going back to the Packers. Ian Rappaport of NFL Network says he's getting four years, 200 million. And then McAfee says that's not true. Rodgers tweets it's not true. Do we know where we stand on money? For Aaron well, Rogers. Rogers also tweeted that it's not true that he signed the extension. Nobody reported the, that he had signed it. Ian said that Rogers agreed to terms, which means we have a deal. We don't have the actual paperwork. I haven't put my name on it. And I don't know why Rogers likes playing these stupid word games, oh, he whether loves it's vaccinated or game. immunized yeah. or, you know, I, it's not true that I signed a contract. No one's saying that you signed the, the value that was reported is inaccurate. It, it, it's, it's, there's two explanations. One would be, that it's a four-year, $200 million extension, making it a five-year, $226 million contract. So that would be a legitimate way to quibble if you are so inclined. And the other thing could be, it's just a rounding error. Like instead of four years, 200, it's four years, 199.5 or four years, 200.5. I mean, whatever right. it is, you know, right. you can technically say it's not accurate, but 
I, I, I hate the phrase you're better than that when someone directs it at me because they have no idea. Right. But I can I can truthfully say to Aaron Rodgers, you're better than that. Why are you worried about that? Why are you sending out this tweet that's going well, to confuse he, fans? It, he it, clearly, it has to confuse the fans when they see that, like what's really going on here. He clearly gets off on playing this game. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, this is his M.O. Um, you know, <sighs> Rodgers is fascinating to me because I don't, I don't think he's a bad guy. I don't have like any, but I've ne- I can't remember seeing a top level athlete go through such a heel turn. I mean, I, you know, and you, listen, you know this better than anyone. You hate to just go off of Twitter and, and use Twitter as the guide for this. But I mean, this is a guy, if you go to September of last year or August, let's say August, September, you know, the whole country basically wanting this guy to become the host of Jeopardy. And now on Tuesday, when the Russell Wilson trade happened, people on Twitter are like, ha ha, Aaron Rodgers couldn't have the day to himself. Aaron Rodgers must be so pissed off right now. Aaron Rodgers, you know, it's amazing. The 180 that's been done on Aaron Rodgers. And I don't think I listen, obviously the COVID and the, 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 games and antics with the, with the vaccine is a, is a big part of this and the Joe Rogan. And, but I think it's actually more than that. I think, I think people, I think I may have said this or written this recently. I think there are people, you and I have seen it for a while, but the average sport fan who's maybe not in it, they're seeing now that this is all a game to him and he likes playing this game. Oh, I agree with you. What was the issue that came up? He had the book Atlas Shrugged in the background when he was right, on the right. cast and it turned yeah. out he had he never read, read it. it. He can't even pronounce Ayn Rand's first name properly. I, right. It's just, it's weird to me. And I really do feel like number one, he's messing with us. Number Absolutely. two, he enjoys it. And number three, he doesn't mind. He used to be ultra sensitive to any criticism whatsoever. He's gotten to a point in his life where he just doesn't care anymore. It may just be a function of being 38. I remember when I turned 35 and I'd always wondered why they care about the 18 to 35 demographic for advertisers. When I turned 35, I realized crap that I used to care about. I don't care about anymore. It's just the function of aging. And I think he's gotten to a point where he doesn't care about this idea that no one should hate him. And he's tripped into this mode where he will accept the personality cult that loves him If it means there's going to be folks at the other end of the spectrum who hate him, he'll revel in the love and tolerate the hate. And and from time to time, he'll push some buttons just just to to be the topic of conversation. I think above all else, he loves the attention. I think that's undeniable. Right. Because if he didn't like getting so much shit, which is what's happened to him, he wouldn't do McAfee every week. I mean, that's all you need to know. The fact that he does that show every week. Now, I think he's very, very, very smart about it. He uses it to play his game and to send out his messages and all, you know, and, and do all that. And he, like you said, gives him the attention he needs. I mean, Pat's, you know, his show's tremendous in, in terms of listenership, viewership. And very simply, if Aaron Rodgers was tired of all this, he just wouldn't do the McAfee show. Yeah, it's something he's consciously decided to do in the past couple of years where he has what he calls his platform. It's his place where he can say what he wants unchallenged by anyone else. He never gets into a real debate with anyone because they never press him. And I'm not saying they should, because if they did, Jimmy, he wouldn't do it. At times he reminds me of, and this is one of my favorite movies from the 80s, A Fish Called Wanda, the faux intellectual Otto. He reminds me of that where Mm -hmm. he wants us all to think he's really smart. But I can't help but wonder if you were ever in a situation where you just have to scratch the surface. He ain't as smart as he wants us all to think he is. Well, you know, listen, I'm not I don't know him to judge that. I do think he's smart in terms of how he's playing this whole media game. Um, You know, there was a tweet that people started, you know, when the report came out from Rappaport that he's getting 50 million dollars a year. People started retweeting his famous quote about the woke mob is trying to cancel him. Well, <laughs> had that You should all be so canceled. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Let me ask you this from a football standpoint. Now, I love football. I watch every Sunday, every game. Favorite sport, I'm, I'm in it. But I'm still the dummy that I don't know the salary cap situation. Now, I hear 50 million a year, and I think, how can they sign other players? Can you explain how that all works? Well, one of the reasons the Packers desperately need to sign him to a new contract 
is that his cap number based upon past contracts for this year is $46.66 million, even though he's only due to make 26 million. So they had to come up with a new contract that would knock down this year's cap number. And you do it by taking most of the compensation he's due to make this year, convert it to a signing bonus, add more money. It gets divided, it gets spread. And it's as simple as this. Teams will kick the can every year. And I'll just use the example of a million dollars. When you have the salary cap going up as much as it will be going up, it went up 25 million from last year to this year. We're going to be farther removed from the pandemic, more TV money coming online, more gambling money falling out of the sky. What happens is the cap keeps going higher and higher and higher. So that million dollars this year means a lot less. It's a smaller percentage of the total cap next year. So you kick as much as you can to the next year. So if he's getting 50 million a year on average over the life of the deal, what's going to happen is the cap numbers early will be low. The cap numbers later will be mammoth. And at some point you got to take your reckoning. At some point you're going to have Aaron Rodgers not on the team anymore and a major cap charge still on the books. That's what ultimately will happen for the Green Bay Packers And other teams have done that. It's one of the realities of having a franchise quarterback. When you separate from the franchise quarterback, whenever that happens, there's going to be a big cap charge that's left over the first year that he's gone. So when the player gets the big money late and then they cut him, is that what's considered the dead money, dead cap money that I hear about? Yeah, the dead money basically is all of the payments that he's received that get spread out over multiple years. When he's cut, it all accelerates into this year. Now, gotcha. if he's cut after June 1, it doesn't. Right. And if he's okay. traded after June 1, it doesn't. And if he's cut mm. after March 16 with a post-June 1 designation, it doesn't. But that's the idea. All the money he's already been paid, where the cap dollars are pushed out to future years. Once he's gone, it all hits. And then they'll now. be screwed. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to watch the games. I don't want to do math. The only math I like to do is minus seven, minus three. That's right. That's right. Um, Calvin Ridley before, does too. Yes. Well, I just did a whole thing with Calvin Ridley uh, in my train of thought segment. Uh, so I don't want to get, I'll just do it quickly here. I think a one year suspension is absurd in terms of. Agreed. hundred okay. percent. Because the issue, the issue is it's a problem. If a guy's fixing games, if a guy's not fixing games, there's really no harm in a guy betting a football game. If he's a player, you don't want the guy fixing the games or do, and you're not do the, the players in this era with the money they're making betting on DraftKings app. That's not happening. That's my, so you want well, to, Jimmy, four Jimmy, games, I can, five I can, games, I can bolster five. your argument. Let me bolster yeah. it real quickly. Yeah, yeah. Cause I don't know if you got into this. Cause we yeah. wrote about this. It surprised me when I saw the policy and at first it didn't even register. They're allowed to bet on every other sport, right? They're allowed to bet on college football, college basketball, MLB, everything except pro football. So if you have a guy who's disconnected from his team, he's on the non-football illness list, there's no evidence he had inside information, he clearly can't affect the games he's not playing. How how is that the same concern as a guy who's actively in the locker room, getting the information, possibly on the take, whatever, whatever. So I, I don't think they should be allowed to bet on anything. But if they're allowed to bet on everything but pro football, a guy who's not with his team betting some parlays, I don't think that justifies a year. There's been five guys suspended by the NFL for gambling over 100 plus seasons, and it's all one year. And I feel like there needs to be an understanding that there should be some variance. Right. Uh, To me, he broke a rule, suspend him, but a year seems just so extreme for what, you know, but we don't use common sense anymore. Before we get to playmakers, just a couple of quick things. You think Tom Brady stays retired? No. He retired from the Buccaneers. He did not retire. Remember that Instagram post? And he thanked everybody in the organization, didn't mention the Patriots. And that was kind of a thing for a while until the Brian Flores lawsuit was filed that afternoon. I I think he is intending to retire from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And he's going to make his move at some point to get the Buccaneers to release him or trade him. And he's going to have a very compelling argument. He signed a two-year contract in 2020. He did a one-year extension last year for cap purposes, the kind of stuff we were just talking about. Right. Not because he wanted to extend his commitment by a year. You call up somebody with the last name of Glazer, you make the case, brought you a Super Bowl, filled your stadium, please let me go. I still think week one, he's going to be the 49ers starting quarterback. Week one? Week one. I mean, he'll be there before then, but I think when the season begins, when we're digesting Russell Wilson in Denver and Deshaun Watson wherever, I think Tom Brady is going to be the quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers in 2022. I, when I asked that question, I thought, you know, week eight, some QB gets no. hurt. You know, no. I don't know. Mac Jones stinks. The Patriots bring him back or the night week one. 
I think he's, I think that, that this was a calculated move twofold. One, he's going to spend four or five months with his family exclusively, and he's going to work his way behind the scenes to get back. Look, and, and there are many things we as the media can be blamed for. We cannot be blamed for this because it was only six days after he retired, retired, that he's on his podcast saying, never say never. Right. And, and he said other things since then. Right. It only bolstered it. Last week with Fred Couples, what he said there as he's getting ready to go sleep in the bed that he slept in right. growing up, dreaming of the 49ers. And somebody on Twitter pointed this out last week. Kyle Shanahan, not at the Combine in Northern California. Tom Brady in Northern California. Brian Greasy, former teammate at Michigan, hired to be the quarterback's coach in San Francisco. I, I really do think that's the direction it's moving. He wanted it two years ago, and they said, no, thank you. And how right. stupid they must feel now that they said no thanks to Tom Brady in 2020. And, and you think it's San Fran or nothing, though? Or could he go somewhere? Is it only San Fran in the, in the mix? Well, Miami was in the mix before the Flores lawsuit was filed. Right, right. Miami was going to go after Tom Brady and Sean Payton. And the filing of the Flores lawsuit caused the plug to be pulled on that. Now, Miami privately will allow that they've talked about minority ownership for Brady. But I think, you know, they're not going after Sean Payton to have Sean Payton coach Tua Tonga by Loa. That's for damn sure. They had another planet quarterback, and I think it was Tom Brady, but that got derailed. Now, I don't know where else he would go right now where you can walk into a place where the deck is stacked in your favor like it was in Tampa. And you look at the 49ers. You look at how good they've been with a mid-level quarterback. Right. You put Tom Brady on the 49ers, they're the Super Bowl favorite. Going in, whatever, whatever odds you want to put, they go to the top of the stack, in my mind, as the favorite to win it all this year. That would be something. Holy cow. I, I, I wanted him to get into broadcasting. I guess that's not going to happen. You mentioned Flores and the Dolphins. The other thing, I wrote a column last week. I am in love with Mike McDaniel. What a breath of fresh air in the NFL this guy is. I mean, he he was at the Combine and did a bunch of stuff with eyes in. Uh, your show. You, you, yeah. yeah, it was your show. It was awesome. Right? It was I got awesome. most of the clips right. Um, it's funny. I didn't even put that together. It was your show that sort of prompted that. And then the eyes in thing. Um, and then uh, when John Lynch was given the press conference, he was waving at him. Um uh, just uh, how can you not love this guy's personality? It, it, can he work as a head coach here? Can he, or, you know, the thing is, oh, you know, is he good is, with that personality now translate to getting 53 men to listen to him and follow him? What's going to go on there? I remember when the Eagles fired Chip Kelly, Jeff Lurie, the owner of the team was talking about the importance of emotional intelligence. And it felt like they had it with Doug Peterson until it all kind of fell apart there. But I look at Mike McDaniel and I say, this guy gets it. He's got the emotional intelligence. He knows what to say. In, and I don't know that his relationship with each individual player is going to be different like a Jimmy Johnson would do. Mm -hmm. I, I think that he is so unique and authentic and disarming that his way will gravitate people toward him in a very enigmatic and powerful way where he doesn't have to be – one way with this guy, one way with that guy, just be himself. And he'll be himself dealing with these different personalities, dealing with an owner who is a difficult person to deal with and right. who has clashed with Brian Flores and before that, Adam Gase. I, I, th I think it's going to work. I I'm rooting for Mike McDaniel. How can I he not root for that guy? Yeah, I, I, th I think that, uh, and it's going to be fun to watch. And yep. he's so different than what we've seen. But, yeah, and, and maybe it's as simple as, because we get so much BS from coaches because they right. have to, they feel like they have to lie to us about certain things. Right. He's just himself. And I think it's a great lesson for all of us. Just be yourself. Uh, to the, and, uh, uh, things tend to work out. To the people listening, it, when you're done listening to this, go on YouTube and look up the interview that, that Chris Sims and, and Mike did with uh, McDaniel. I was tremendous. Last one, and then we'll do a couple of minutes on Playmakers, how the NFL really works and doesn't. New book by Mike Florio on Amazon. You can get it. Just give me 30 seconds here. What, what's going to happen with Deshaun Watson? Well, grand jury convenes on Friday, and they're going to look at the criminal complaints that have been pending against Deshaun Watson for a while. Rusty Harden, his lawyer, is very confident that at the end of the day, he's not going to be charged. They believe that what he did does not rise to the level of a crime. And if he's not charged, especially not with felonies, I think come next week, he's in play, whether it's the Panthers, there's been talk of Washington, although that, that'll be a tough sell from a PR standpoint, given their other issues. But then again, their PR is already pretty bad. Like he, how much if, worse does it get if you give Deshaun Watson his next opportunity? But right. I think he's going to jump to an NFC team next week if if he's not indicted on felony charges. I was going to say, if if he's not in jail or indicted or whatever the legal ramifications are, he's starting week one and where? 
Well, maybe not week one, because I go back to the Ben Roethlisberger case, Jimmy, from 2010. Roethlisberger was never arrested or charged, but he was suspended six games, reduced to four after the incident in Millersville, Georgia, where there was an allegation of sexual misconduct. I I think the league and there's 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 a bracing for this in Watson's camp of anywhere from four to eight weeks suspension. So if you trade for him, you better be ready for him to not be available week one. But this is a long term play. And it seemed like the Panthers that is desperate to get a franchise quarterback. Right. They're going to be in the mix. You hear the things that Ron Rivera and Martin Mayhew have said from Washington. How can they not be in the mix, even if it is a PR mess? So, somebody's going to get him, but he, he is likely to face a suspension to start the season. Gotcha. All right. Mike has a new book out, Playmakers, How the NFL Really Works and Doesn't. Tell everyone what it's about. Well, it takes a look, Jimmy, at the last 20 years in the NFL through a series of stories, scandals, controversies, interesting little things that when you see the name of the chapter, you may think, why the hell did this idiot reserve a thousand words for this topic? And the explanation may be that the guy who wrote it's an idiot, but it also may be there's something interesting in there that you'll see. And when you read it and understand how it was handled, you'll get some insight into how the NFL operates and maybe where it needs to improve. So we broke it down into 10 different categories. And within each category, it goes chronologically over the last 20 years, different examples, different controversies, whether it's Spygate, whether it's the Mike Vick situation, whether it's the John Gruden trade from 20 or from 2002, whatever it is that I think is instructive on how the league works, how the league doesn't. And then the final section is about the future, the things the league needs to be concerned about. A lot of gambling stuff in there, not just you better be concerned about people gambling, but you better be damn concerned about how your inside information is handled. Whether it's injury reports, we know those are worthless. Somebody knows the truth. Who's getting paid for the truth? Game planning. Who's getting paid to tell somebody what the plan is for the star running back this week? Is it going to be over or under 65.5 yards? Whatever the case may be, there's a lot of inside information, and the NFL currently doesn't have a good procedure in place to protect it. Give me, yeah, in, a, in one minute, give me something outside of the gambling that you have in playmakers as the biggest concern for the league going forward. Competition. Someone finally realized, and I'm not advocating this, mm. but we hear all the time how the NFL has changed. And there's that 30% of the country that doesn't like the way the NFL is right now. It's not like it used to be. It's not a man sport anymore. You know, we hear all that stuff. As the NFL tries desperately to respect and protect the health and safety of the players. I'm surprised this hasn't happened yet. And I think we've talked about this before. Someone starts a league that plays old school Rock'em Sock'em robots football with all the rule changes that have been implemented over the last 40 years gone like that. You go back and watch the old games on YouTube. It is jarring to mm-hmm. see how they used to play. Mm -hmm. And I think if someone would do it, there would be a market for it. And uh, it's not illegal. There are moral and ethical questions. But someone who's got $10 billion or less than that, probably, you could start a football league where everyone and guys would sign away. How many more football leagues do we need, though? We got the XFL, the USFL. I'm talking about in-season NFL competition, Tuesday, Wednesday night, something like that. But, but, But Jimmy... There, I, I see those complaints all the time. And I know Twitter isn't the real world, yeah. but people don't like the rules that protect quarterbacks, the rules that protect receivers, the rules that protect anyone. They want it to be blood sport. And my point is, I, I feel like at some point someone's going to do it. I and I'm surprised it. it hasn't happened yet. And that, that will be an issue for the NFL because if it's popular, what does the NFL do about right. its product? Oh, that's a good one for sure. So that you can all check that out. Playmakers. How the NFL Really Works and Doesn't by Mike Florio on Amazon. And uh, appreciate you coming on and uh, try to get some rest this week. This has been, this is, yeah. when you say get weeks like this, you just must be like clapping and dancing in your house, right? Is it, well, is it's a delirium. boom for pro football talk. Delirium alcohol. And I'll quote yeah. the great Bon John, uh, Bon John <laughs> Bovi or John Bon Jovi when I say I, I'll sleep when I'm dead. That's it right there. All right, Mike. Thanks. Good luck with the See book. You. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Take care. All right, joining me now, back from vacation, back for our weekly train of thought segment on the SI Media Podcast, my friend Sal Akata from WFAN Radio in New York, SNY TV in New York. Sal, how are you? Uh, how do I look? Nice and refreshed after uh, you know seven days away with the wife and 10-month-old? Because uh, I'm not. So, so is that one of those vacations, huh? <laughs> yeah. 
it was a learning experience. It was fine. The baby was good, thankfully, but uh, it was not a. It's not a real vacation if you go away with a ten month old. It's as right. simple as that. Yeah, that's not a vacation. Yeah. Um. Wait. Did you stay away from Twitter? I did actually. Now I, I stayed up on um, the news because of the baseball, you know, lockout. Right. I wanted to see what was going on with that, but for the most part, I did stay away uh, from Twitter. I was logged out on the Friday that I was off, and I did not log back in. Log back in until about that next Friday or Saturday, something, which was nice. There you go. That had to be a relief. That was a good break. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's get into. Let's get right into some topics because this first one will be near and dear to your heart. We're ta- so I did not know until when did I see my buddy Diesel on Sunday? I saw my buddy Diesel who alerted me to the fact that in New York, where we are, you cannot bet legally on the legal websites, FanDuel, DraftKings, all that. You can't bet the ACC tournament because it's at the Barclays Center in New York. Well, I don't so get, I yeah, guess that doesn't make sense to me. So the way it works, so I didn't know this. It you cannot bet college. This is just New York. You can't bet college sports being played in New York. So you can't bet. I guess you weren't allowed to bet St. John's games all year. Um, the first round of the NCAA NCAA tournament, I think, is in Buffalo. You can't bet those games. Do they, but do they give a reason why? Like, I, I don't know. I, I why, why, they, why can I go to Jersey and bet the college game, but not in New York? That doesn't make I, sense. I mean, this will tie into Calvin Ridley, which we'll get into. But I guess the, the thought is that you can maybe convince a college kid to throw a game because they're not making any money. Right. But why? Why wouldn't you? Like, but my point is, Jersey is not that far from New York. Well, because obviously. every state has their own legislation. All right. But if you it's, if if the, it, gam- if, the yeah. gambling laws are state by state. Right. It just doesn't add up similar to some of the, you know, the, the rules that we see with uh, the COVID restrictions or why certain guys could play and certain other guys couldn't. Uh, if you're on the Mavericks, you can play in New York, but if you're on the Nets, you can't. But, right. uh, you know, if you're not vaccinated or whatever. But with that, I just if you could bet in Jersey on college sports, why wouldn't you or well, wherever no, else? Why wouldn't you bet? New York wrote a different law. It's just stupid. Yeah. But well, whatever. I don't know. And I don't understand why the ACC tournament is played at the Barclays Center. That makes no re- sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> well, that's all another But like issue, the right? Big East tournament's played at the Garden, and you can't bet those games. Right. So I, I was shocked to find that out, and I think it's ridiculous as well. But yeah. it ties into Calvin Ridley because I thought the one-year suspension was absurd. And as I wrote about, the reason why betting on NFL football would be bad if you're a player is if you bet against your own team and you're throwing a game, that's the only reason it would be bad. There's no other reason it's bad. NFL players are not Calvin Ridley has an $11 million contract with the Falcons. He's not going to fix a game. makes no sense to win a thousand dollar bet. So there's just, no. this is like everything else now in life. There's no common sense apply. And we're like, you can't bet on football. You can't, if you're a player, you can, okay, let's play it out then. How come? Well, he could well, fix the game. So you think the guy making eleven million dollars is going to fix the game? Well, I think I don't think that it's about necessarily he could fix the game. I think it's about you're compromising the integrity How? of the league. How? You just you can't be a player in the league and place wagers on it. And and Why it's not? not just it's but not, you're just not giving me one. any reasons. Why not? Well, what if everybody did it then? Would you you'd have no problem with everybody betting I don't on the think- game? I don't think, given the salary of every NFL player. You no, know, Ridley, by the way, doesn't make a lot of money. He was scheduled to make money this particular year. Now, I don't think his bets were trying to do that, which I think makes it even worse. If he would have come out and said, I had a gambling problem and I bet millions of dollars on these games, I would have said, you know what? At least I could understand the guy needs help and he's trying to win some money. Well, then what the hell are you doing betting? Oh. That, yeah, that's 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 so hypocritical. He's looking for some action. He's looking for some. But fun. you can't do that. You. What, you but again, it's not, you're it's not, not allowed. Me, why not? I, I mean, that's the rules. You can't do it. So you're right, you want to change the rule? rule. Because the majority of people will have a problem. There are people already that think that the league is on the fix and on the take. Well, those way are before not gambling was even a, right. Well, but that's right. the majority of people. Well, a lot of but, people no, think no. that. But there's a difference between being a psychopath who thinks Roger Goodell is fixing the games. Right. Then thinking that Aaron Rodgers is going to throw an interception on purpose so he can win a $500 bet. 
Right. These players are not fixing games. But they it's make, not about Aaron Rodgers who's making two hundred million. It's about the guys who aren't making anything. Right, but the, the lowest salaried guy in the NFL is probably still making like you know five hundred thousand dollars. You think he's going to throw a game to make a thousand dollar bet? I mean, in in that scenario that you're painting, no. But, but maybe the there only... are other guys. Maybe there are people, fringe players or guys who are making a lot of money who tell somebody, "Hey, bet this or that." And I do think with the limitations on props, you know, the, the idea. Right. I'm in agreement with you that I don't think an NFL player is going to get rich by gambling on his own team or not. Right. But it's just a, it is a clear to me violation of trust, and it's just something you simply cannot do unless they change rules and say, "Hey, anybody can bet." There are people that even work, and I'm sure you know this, that work in the NFL that are not allowed to bet on games or, or right. go in casinos or whatever it may be. I the rule is NFL players are not allowed to bet on NFL games. That is the rule. It's crystal clear. My right. you issue want to know is why the rule? Why is, is that the rule? Because that was the rule 50 years ago when players maybe weren't making money and they had bookies on the side that they met it. But if they're doing it, if Calvin Ridley or any player is making wagers on DraftKings, they're not fixing game. They're, they're not, but, like, well, let me ask you this. You've seen Floyd Mayweather, right, who bets a ton of different money on sports, right? And Floyd Mayweather, do you think he needs the 50 grand or 100 grand or whatever I mean, he, he's betting? I don't know what he does. I know. I don't know what he he's. I, I would assume he's looking for action like all of us. Well, correct. For action. But, but but that then be, can become a problem to where if you are betting, you know, $50,000, I know it was not a lot to a millionaire or whatever, but still they don't want to lose. They're betting for the action. You want to win that. They're all, I mean, even though you may not need it, you, you still. Well, if Calvin Ridley was betting the Falcons to lose, that right. would be the only scenario in my book where this would be a problem. He, but the guy was home for five days, not playing and went on his phone and made some prop bets. That to me, I mean, parlays, which is, what yeah, you're yeah. which is what you're addicted to. Yeah. I don't think that warrants a one year suspension. Like, can we use some kind of, like he's, his crime is betting on NFL games, which is clearly banned and clearly not right. allowed. Fine. But can we use some common sense here with the punishment? Like he didn't fix a game. He's not looking to fix a game. He didn't bet against the Falcons. He made parlay bets on an app. We got to suspend them for the year. Right. So you want, because an individual basis, use common sense. What he did was not. Suspend them for four games and say, listen, don't do this again. If you do it again, you kicked out of the league. Right. But, well, that, see, to me, that's the bigger issue is that they should have a distinct penalty Right or wrong, and I know people compare it to, oh, well, how come this guy could hit his girlfriend or wife and get two games, and a guy bets well, a simple one has parlay. nothing to do with the other. You're correct. One has nothing right. to do with the other. But if that were going, if, if the rule was, and this is the NFL's fault, they should have come out in the beginning and said, if you are caught gambling on a game, I don't care if it's $5, I don't care if it's $5 million. If you bet as an NFL player in an NFL game, you are out of the league. That would prevent people from doing it. Now, Ridley should know better. I don't know what this idiot was thinking when he Come made on, that bet. How can you say that? You because bet. they know. They know. I'm not an NFL player. If WFAN came to me and said, you can't do this, otherwise okay. you lose your job, I'm not doing it. It's as simple as that. I can't do drugs. I can't drink and drive, whatever it may be, okay. because I can't risk losing my job. It's as simple as that. But if you're going to put it on that level, everyone does things, has done things at their job they're not supposed to do. If you knew you were getting drug tested each week from Sports Illustrated, you're going to go do drugs knowing that you could get in trouble? I would not. I mean, that's just me because, and I don't think you would either. You're not going to risk your, well, so so this is a similar thing with the NFL. You know, He's got to know. I know that they've told these players at nauseum. Oh, I'm not bet. disputing. I'm not disputing that at all. I'm not disputing that at all. I'm disputing the penalty. I'm disputing whether the, I think the, the thing needs to be changed. I think, you know what, if right. you're an NFL player, you want to bet on an NFL game, make the rule. Listen, if you're an NFL player, the rule should be bet on any NFL game you want. You can't bet on your team. Obviously, you can't bet on your team to lose that kick out of the league. You right. bet your team to win. You want to say you do that, you're banned fine. But if Calvin really wants to bet a Bills Jaguars game, what's the harm in that? Would you have um, an issue with a referee betting on a game? Absolutely. Now, why though? What's the difference? If he's not playing in the game, I mean, you, what could a, you don't you don't think a ref could call a holding penalty? And I, I do, but I would have a problem with that. But I don't understand how you could say that you would have no issue with a player betting. Well, what on is a the game. play? The, because I don't think a player is going to fix a game or throw a all game. Right, well, what if what if a referee could bet on a game that he's not refereeing? Then would you have an issue with that? Not at all. He could do yeah. that. See, I mean, I, now you're just getting into the where you're opening up. It, it, the only way to possibly prevent 
the fans from losing the trust within the game, which a lot of them don't have any right or wrong. You, you you don't trust the game now because Calvin Ridley bets some parlays. Oh, I don't. I don't think anybody trusts the game fully prior to that. And how could you say that you should? Now, I'm not one of these conspiracy theorists, and I try to leave you know all that stuff out of it. I want to watch a game and believe that it's on the level and there's integrity to it. That's I mean, I love sports. However, it has been proven in years that, I mean, they had a referee in the NBA fixing games. Right, but that's different. Calvin Ridley, if, he's only fixing the game if he's betting against the Falcons, which he did not do. And again, if he has an $11 million contract, he's not fixing a game to win $1,000. It makes it, He's not doing that. The guy wanted some action. He was bored. I can relate to it. It's, I don't think it's – to suspend him for a year makes – and by the way, no sense to me. He might get more than that, and he'd be lucky if he doesn't. I mean, he's only he's suspended indefinitely, and he's got to appeal that at the end of the year. But I just think it's so stupid. And it is. So, he should be suspended alone for stupidity. You can't bet. Forget the act itself. You can't do it. It's very simple. Have your cousin place the bet for you. Why do you got to? Why do you got to go do it yourself? One has nothing to do with the other. He can be out and not play and make and sit there and he's bored and there's an NFL game on his TV and he wants some action. And Why I, couldn't he just go to his friend or cousin and say, hey, put five? He's betting 1500 bucks, right? It's not like because he's betting made $5 it, million. They've made it very easy to do it on your phone. He probably didn't think he would get caught. To me, this is like it's it's someone doing something at work they're not supposed to do, but people do it. You know what it's like? How many people listening to this podcast right now, I'd love to know, have stolen a package of like printing paper from your office where you work. And then you right. bring it home and use that in your printer. Like you do stuff at work. You're not supposed to do. You think you're going to get away with it. I'm not saying this is on that level. My only, my issue is the suspension. The suspension to me is absurd. The guy did not do anything that bad. It, he broke a rule. Right. But I just don't know how, let's say they suspended him four games. Then how did like, what message does that send? I think a lot of players are like, here's oh, four games, that's say, it? Here's what the message said. It would send this message. You know what? If you bet on an NFL game, it's really not that big of a deal. Because it's right. not. It's right. not. But the, but it is. In reality, I, I do think it is. I mean, we... Why? You, you can't have just players betting on the sport because eventually you're going to have people that do things that question the integrity of the game. I you, you're thinking more. You're thinking just one line of... Okay, well, they're going to fix the game and try to make millions of dollars and save their life. That, there's there's little things that could go into it too. What if they say, "Hey, you know what? We're going to run the football. Uh, the the game plan is to run the football over 25 times this year." And he tells his entire family to you know to bet and make money on on something, and then specifically go out there and try to have a game plan that they run the football so his family can win. There there are so many different. But Calvin Ridley can't impact whether the Falcons are running the football. Well, not Calvin Ridley, another player. It's not just Calvin Ridley. Yeah, Calvin, you don't Ridley, think that, Calvin you don't think... Ridley can't impact crap because the guy quit on the football team. So there are two things, two issues with Ridley. Number one, he quits on the football team and says he needs to get his mental health right. And he's number two, he's gambling. He's gambling on games. You can, I mean, you are an idiot and you're embarrassing the team that you play for. He should, he, if I'm the Falcons, I'd kick him off the team. And I think, look, I think it should be the severest penalty. So you, right or wrong oh, results. This is so ridiculous. The you're, results may vary. You can't do it. You can't bet on an NBA game it's just, or an NFL game if you're an NFL player. And same thing for the other leagues. You just can't do it. It questions the integrity of the This sport. is like your worst take ever. It really is your worst. I don't see ever. how you I don't see how you can't understand why this is a severe, potentially severe issue. Unless he's fixing games, it's not an issue at all. It's like saying if somebody was pulled over for drunk driving and he didn't kill anybody or get into an accident, well, it's okay. You shouldn't get the harshest penalty. No, it's about what could happen potentially. And obviously I know the two were right. significantly. And there's no but. chance of what if someone's driving drunk, they could very easily kill someone. There's right. no chance Calvin Ridley's fixing a football game. There's no chance of it. He's making $11 million. Uh, it, no, he's not. Ridley That's did not his contract. That. His contract. He has an $11 million contract. Oh, now it's voided. And by the way, he was. I'm he, talking but, about before he well, got He suspended. didn't make $11 million bucks. This was his year to make that. 
So Ridley, look before that. I believe this was the only year he was due to make that. So it's not like he was making big money. Before. But but aside from that, because I'm with you, I don't think Ridley was doing this to make money necessarily. That's Matter why fact, I think he, it's absurd. But what if it's the next guy? What if it's the guy that's watching the halftime show, the long snapper for the Bengals, that doesn't give a crap about his team? He's watching the halftime show. What if he wants to have a bad snap in a game because he wants to make 500000 bucks or a million bucks but on his way out the door? Even the long snapper is probably making $500,000 and he's not going to, you can't go on DraftKings and make a $500,000 bet on a missed feel like it's, there's no reality to this. These there's limits on all these sites. There's, they can't, you can't, you, you can't bet more than like $50 on a prop bet. I mean, they're not, there's nothing here. That's that, that scenario doesn't exist of, a, of someone trying to fix the game. Yeah, and then I think it just comes to fundamentally differences because if you are you personally are okay with finding out players or betting on games, then that's your opinion. I would think you're in the minority. Not that that makes it wrong. That's just you I just, and your opinion. I have, not I have a big problem with that. Outside of fixing a game, I, I don't know one reason why a football player can't bet on a football game. It's just a bad. It's it's just bad. You, you why? It, it, it's a bad look. You, I wouldn't want to watch a game knowing that the players are betting on some of the games that they're playing in. Whether it's whether it's because of definitively they can make a difference in their bank account or not, it just is a you know bad optics, which I hate that term, but that's the reality of the situation. Knowing that the guy's playing in the game, or, well, what about coaches then? Can co what about the assistant coach who may get fired year after year after year? Is he allowed to bet on the game? You have no problem with that? Again, I would make the rule: don't bet on your team. Right, but, but it if just the becomes... Jets, if the Jets, is, if the Jets assistant coach bets a, bets a Chargers Chief game, who cares? <laughs> right. I That's, mean, I just, I just. Don't, and again, I, the I, assistant coach is probably making a million dollars. Right. It, it's just to me a, a, a common sense integrity thing where it's I a no brainer. There's no need for it. What's the need for Calvin Ridley or anybody to bet on the game? You're getting you paid bet. How can you say that when you bet? I'm not an NFL player. It's a big difference. I'm allowed to bet. But he's still a human being. He wants some action. He's bored watching a game. All right, but again, if you bring the drug scenario into it, if your job says you can't do drugs. that's not what this is. This has nothing to do with drugs. It, we're not talking about it. It's your job betting. saying you can't do it. You can't do it. End right. of story. So he, got, so he should get punished. But I, I, it's the length of the punishment. A whole year to me makes no sense for something that's not that big of a deal. It's oh, just I, not. So you, just think, you think it now should be four or five this. games. Let me ask you this question. If Aaron Rodgers bet three thousand dollars on DraftKings, do you think Roger Goodell is spending him for the whole season? There's no chance. I mean, There's but no then, chance. but then you could say the league is the league is on the take for a different reason. Maybe not gambling, but then it's not right. Which I think that there's some truth to it. So I think the lack of it. Same thing with Brady. You know, we're talking about if or if Rodgers, you know, had the COVID issue during the playoffs. You think that they're missing a game, or you think Patrick Mahomes is going to miss a game in the Super Bowl because of COVID? No, it wouldn't happen. So that's why I think that there's issues with the league to begin with. And I also think that this is a preventative measure. Ridley, unfortunately, had to be made an example. So something like that does happen but even rogers if rogers bet three hundred thousand bucks what's the difference is he doing it to get rich no so you could say that with any well, he, of these nfl he players can't bet three hundred thousand dollars like drift kings is not taking a three hundred no but you can bet. take you a uh, straight on a game you could maybe not on a problem i don't think that much and a lot of these There's a lot no of these nice. a lot of the I and mean, you could go into a sports book somewhere and, and bet that much but and look gambling is going to happen anyway you don't think that just because this players bet on games 100 percent they bet on games well that's what i'm saying he's also not the only nfl player that bet on a game last year i can guarantee you that i can guarantee right. you that he's just the dumb the the dumbest one to do it on his phone with all his information on it right, but i again i hate that we all do dumb we've all done dumb things we've all done things at work we shouldn't do and it sometimes happens. you get and sometimes you get you have to pay the right. consequences and i want the punishment to fit the crime and in this case, I don't think it's even remotely close. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think you have to send the message. This specific, you know, act doesn't warrant a year if you look at what he did. No, but, but to me, the stupidity alone should say, hey, look, you obviously have to learn a lesson here. And I don't know if sending the message of four or five games really teaches that lesson. That's your best take yet. I'll give you that one. You got that. <laughs> I'll give you. Um, we did 20 minutes on this, so I don't even think we're going to go anywhere else. That was that was good enough. I don't know. If, I'm drained from that. I'm drained. <laughs> I need to go bet the ACC tournament now. I mean, well, you gonna, can't. I thought you ask, can't. It's in New York. Calvin Ridley, who he likes. Yeah. I just and don't understand. Do it, you think or... do you think NFL players should be allowed to bet on NBA games? I don't know how you would prevent that. 
And, no. and that's what I mean. Like you're opening up a, a can of worms. Do I think it's a big problem? For, even if they had inside info, I mean, other people have inside info. You don't think some of these bookmakers and all these people have some kind of inside info or, or people that do have broadcasters yeah. or whatever. I mean, so you don't, I mean, you say, I mean, how can you be a, be a gambler and then want all these restrictions? Makes no sense. I, I look, I, I think where you're dealing with the sport, you, you have to have some kind of rules in place. It, do I care if Calvin Ridley or Aaron Rodgers or whoever places a bet on the Knicks? No. And okay. I, I think that when it's become legal, then why shouldn't you? Now, they're allowed, though, aren't they? Aren't they allowed to bet on the – they're just not allowed to bet on the NFL. Right. Right. Okay, so that makes sense to me. That's fine. I, I just think it's a very slippery slope where you're playing with these athletes that can, yeah. you know – that can bet on the games. Otherwise, then just open it up and understand that you're living in a world where everybody can bet on everything, and that's that. And the players get paid enough, so where they're, um, you know, it, it's not going to impact the games. Or be finally, you you come around to my point. Well, well you, but you can even go back to Pete Rose. You think Pete Rose was doing something he shouldn't have been doing as far as as far as fixing a game? I again, don't. Again, he broke a rule, but I don't think what he did is that big of a deal. Well, but he was betting on his team to win. I mean, that's so why I don't think it's a big deal. Well, but the guy's suspended for life. He's never going to get in the whole right. thing. That's I absurd mean, too. I, I, it's hundred percent absurd. But I understand it. I don't like I don't, it. I, think I don't agree big. with it. I, I understand don't. because of what it could lead to. If you open it up and say, "Oh, well, we could bet on our team," you would definitely have. See, even one the Tim Donahue thing. One of those is enough to turn but that's fans different. Off. Yeah, it's different. Right, that's but it different. could happen moving forward with somebody if you don't have a harsh penalty. Yeah, we'll see. Um. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week. This was All good, right. and uh, go <laughs> that's make it. We're go over make, with. All yeah, right. go make your wagers. Yeah, no, no, I'm clean for now. Yeah. Anyway, until that's football what, yeah, season. Now, 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 we'll see what happens. All right, <laughs> talk, talk to you later. later. All right, my many thanks to Chris Mad Dog Russo, Mike Florio, and my buddy Sal Licata for coming on the show this week. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you missed uh, any of the recent episodes last week, Jim Miller on the NFL broadcasting carousel. Two weeks ago, Molly Kieran from First Take. Check those out in the archives and also subscribe to this SI Media Podcast. And if you would uh, find it in your heart to rate and review, that would help as well. All right. We'll see you next week right here on the SI Media Podcast. Stay safe and take care.